<laughs> I think so. I think we're uh, I think we're both here and people Thank are popping in. <laughs> people are coming in. Exciting day. We're going to give it till like 10.01 to make sure everyone that wants to get in figures out all their technical stuff and gets in. Should be soon. All right, one more minute, we'll kick it off. All righty. Let's do this. Let's do this. Do <laughs> uh, well, welcome everybody for signing in. Uh, I just want to offer the first congratulations. I can already see all the comments or chat boxes filling up. Eric, congratulations. It's pub day for your book, The Hawk Method. I've got it right here. Boom. <laughs> it's uh, an excellent read. I'm excited to uh, get into this conversation with you. But first and foremost, man, congratulations. How does it feel Thank to you. finally get to pub day? It's surreal, honestly. Like it's one of the, not that I haven't put this kind of work into other things, but it's, I think the most focused project I've ever done because we started this like over two and a half years ago. So the fact that like it's come to fruition here and obviously Hawk's been around, media has been around eight years. So like, but it's not the same, like it's completed on a day, two and a half years later. Feels good. Yeah. Well, again, congratulations. Just a quick uh, couple housekeeping before we get into this conversation. I'm excited to have everyone tuning in from around the world uh, to this webinar. You can put your questions in the Q&A box, not just the chat box, but there's actually a special Q&A box here that you can ask questions. Eric and I are going to have a little conversation about the book, the process, et cetera. And then, of course, we want to open it up to your guys' questions and uh, get that all covered. So make sure as you go, put them in there anytime, and we'll be dropping into the Q&A box to answer questions. Um, but uh, before we kick things off, yeah, Eric, Eric here, serial entrepreneur and now the author of The Hawk Method. We're hoping this thing is going to New York Times bestseller. Um, I uh, had the great pleasure of getting an early copy, get a chance to read it. I love the book, Eric. It really is a fantastic work. And I think something that so many people can learn from. Um, what you know, talk to me. I've written a book. I'm in the middle of writing a second book right now. It is a tough process, like you mentioned. Talk to me about, you know, where the idea started where you finally said, hey, you're a successful businessman, entrepreneur, got a lot of things going on. Like, why a book? Why did you want to write a book? What was the kind of inception of that moment? Yeah, funny enough, I wrote a book with a co-author, sort of ghostwriter before this. And I don't remember where that came from, but I ended up finding a ghostwriter and I wanted to write a book uh, and it still might come out at some point, but called Greedless, which was about doing business without screwing people, basically not being greedy. Like mm -hmm. you can be successful without being greedy and all, you know, really was pushing that narrative. But when we wrote, we actually wrote the book and we got it done. I was not happy with how it turned out. And I also kind of felt like, uh, who am I to preach this? Like, I'm not successful enough yet to try to like, I'm not aspirational enough. If, you know, at some point I'm a billionaire, I think I can write that and I'll mm. probably get scolded for it. But um, it, it, I wanted to send the message out, but it just didn't feel right. So I actually shelved it. And then I, again, about two and a half years ago, I was at a friend of mine, Craig Clemens house for a event party. And a guy named Jesse Tevlo came up to me, started talking to him. He apparently was familiar with Hawk Media and he goes, have you ever wanted to write a book? And I told him about that experience. And he's like, all right, but do you have something you would want to put out there? 
And I was like, well, I've been giving the same talk for like six years now about like how we do marketing and our marketing method. And I could probably put that on paper very quickly because I talk about it all the time. It's not like I need to come up with the content, the content's there. Um, so that could be interesting. And he's like, well, I'd love to write it. I don't usually like ghostwrite, but why don't we do this together? And so, you know, I, I forget exactly how many hours, but I think we only spent like 10 hours on Zoom dictating this book. And as mm. you put it, it's about a half hour per chapter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up coming up with the book and then edited it together and started going through the process. Like the putting the content in the book wasn't hard because it's kind of like, kind of goes to my speaking too. Like I try to stick to what I know. And if you know it, I didn't have to, like, we wanted to pull research to justify some of the things I was saying, but the general content of the book was stuff that we've done for eight years. So it was well, I think that the, I mean, it, it's funny when you say that it's like, oh, it didn't take very long to come up with the book. Actually, it's your life's work. It's totally. things you've been working yeah. on for a long time, Fair. but the book itself of putting the words, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's being modest, but I, I would agree with you, which is you can tell when reading the book, I certainly could tell that it's from a very authentic place that is from a very, you know, knowledgeable space. Um, I also love how it's delivered. I think sometimes these books can get a little bit wonky and then the weeds. And I felt like, you know, you and I were sitting down, we're, we're having a beer and you're just telling me about your work, telling me about your process in a way that's super um, easy to sort of comprehend um, for anyone, I think, which is which one of the great benefits for this book. Speaking of that, when you think about who you wrote this book for, um, you know, who's this book for? When you really thought, you know, I, at least for me, maybe you don't do this, but when I'm sitting in front of my computer and I'm writing my books, I'm thinking like, I imagine one reader or a demographic of readers, you know, sitting across from me and having a dialogue. And so who, when you really think about that, and it could be multiple, but who- Yeah, who it's, it's a few. Book? It's, I mean, it comes down to anyone that wants, wants to understand marketing. So it, a lot of times it's CEOs of companies was probably the number one because I, that's who I deal with a lot and who I end up explaining these things to a lot. And there was like an epiphany I had. I spoke at a YPO conference four years ago and YPO, for those that don't know, is like a really high level, like entrepreneur group. To join it, you have to at least have a minimum of 13 million in revenue in your business. The average has like 70 million. So I'm standing in this room that many years ago, I was definitely at the bottom threshold of people in the room. And I'm like, what the hell am I going to teach these guys? Like they're all way more successful than I am. And then it re I realized, yeah, but they're not necessarily marketers. And so a lot of them are trying to figure out what their CMO is doing all day or what their agency is doing. And so it started with that, but then helping people that are marketers figure out like how to distill what they're doing and how to, you know, explain it better, helping just everyday people want to understand like, how does this, like, all this marketing stuff work? Cause I feel like it's really opaque by intention. Like people are really cagey about how it all works. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to simplify it and make it really easy and easy read. Cause frankly, I'm not a voracious reader. Like I want really easy reads that are easy to digest can happen quickly and just to pick up the main points. And that was the point of this is like, now you have the main points, the main foundation of marketing. And then from there, maybe you're not going to go and become a tactician and actually start practicing marketing. This gives you a good framework into how to get into it, but it at least lets you have the conversation. And also when you're working at a company, when you're running a company, actually be able to identify what marketing should and is doing. Was there ever, I've always been curious about this because, uh, different kind of books that I've read, written myself, but when you're writing a book sort of uh, about your own business, do, is there ever this fear of like, you're giving away the trade secrets for, you know, instead of hiring Hawk for this monthly retainer, now I've got the whole Hawk method in my hands for, you know, 15 bucks. Like, is there ever any like fear? Does that come up or is your belief different than that? I'm just kind of curious yeah. how you balance those two things. Uh, not really. It's, uh, so our mission is accessibility to great marketing. We want it to be accessible. And so if we could, if everything we do could be distilled down into 200 pages and if we could just hand it to someone and they're as good as us, like I'd be an incredible author and a really bad agency, I'd say. So there's kind of <laughs> there. Um, and I would say like, once you understand all this stuff and we do go into a little bit of the tactics per channel, you still have to roll up your sleeves and do it. And we're, you know, our business is built to be cost effective. So we're still a better option than about anything else to get it done. So this actually, I think, is going to benefit our business more than anything, because now our employees have it, our clients have it. And so the idea is now we're speaking the same language. They can actually understand what we're doing. And so there's that's where we have the most conflict on the business side is really a gap in communication. This can help bridge that gap. And so I'm actually more excited about what this does in a positive way than the negatives are like, oh, well, I got your book, so I guess I don't need to hire you anymore. If that individual has the time to go do everything and take this book and then learn to the next degree how to do all this, good for them.
hopefully yeah. that works out. Well, I, I love that thought because I think some people, you know, like I said, kind of hold their trade secrets so close to the chest. Oh, no one yeah. can know it's so it's this opaque thing or whatever. And I think you kind of spell it out here, but to your point, even though you're spelling it out, it's like, yo, there's so much work behind all of that to execute on that. Um, and so it kind of really gives people a nice on-ramp to be able to speak in a common dialogue with you as a client, you know, as you as the agency of record, but then you can go obviously a lot deeper with the people that you have on your team that are, that are experts. Exactly. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the book writing process and I, you know, we don't have to go too much into the book because people should buy the book and read it, but <laughs> I do want to bring back, cause you do talk about this a little bit in the book. And I think it's important at the top of a conversation like this, just to kind of hear about your story, you know, that not, not, uh, not the book, not the marketing tactics, this, but, but who is Eric and, and why did you get into marketing? What were kind of, kind of twists and turns in your journey that has led to this moment? I think that that's, uh, Who's the, who's the man behind the, behind the book, so to speak? <laughs> sure. Appreciate it. Uh, no, funny enough. Like I always say, I made fun of marketing majors when I was in college. Like, I could very clearly remember friends of mine that majored in marketing being like, what do you guys do? Draw pretty pictures. Like what is marketing? And I was a management major, so I had no room to be talking because I don't, I still don't understand what my degree was about, but <laughs> it was, you know, I just, I, I didn't take marketing seriously. I thought it was like this side gig for people that did, couldn't pick a major, but wanted to have fun. And, you know, it was marketing and communications, at least at Arizona, that's what it felt like. But then when I came out of school, uh, I went into real estate. That's a whole other story a week before the banking industry collapsed and made no money and yeah, bad timing in the world um, in 2008. And so I started my first online company in 2009 and quickly realized that like, it isn't hard to deliver a product or service. Like there's a lot of it's reactive in some sense is not proactive. And what I mean by that is like all the problems that come up in supply chain operations product, like you, the problem comes up, you solve it. The problem comes up, you solve it on marketing and sales. It's much more of an opportunity cost. Like there might not seem to be a problem, except for you might not know that there's another 20%, 50%, 100% revenue you could be driving if you're doing things better. And so I found marketing and sales and getting people to actually buy products to be the challenging part of the business that had no limit. And so I started being drawn to that and focused on that because I inherently wanted to focus on the hardest part. And to me, my first company was business coaching for musicians, getting coaches in place, getting a curriculum together. All that was not that hard for me. And I had good connections that we brought in some great people. What was hard was now we have to go get musicians to actually sign up people that don't have a lot of money to sign up, pay 50 bucks a month to actually work with these people. So like, I got to figure out how to market to them and started to you know, understand what, what it's like to like find where they're looking. And we actually hacked Craigslist a lot for that company. And then my next company was a t-shirt subscription company. Same thing. Hold on, I want to stop you right yeah. there. Cause I like sure. the, the interesting part in the book when you, you talk about the music company a little bit and it seems like it's actually going pretty well. Like you guys are making money. It's fairly profitable, but you have a little bit of this aha moment, both with this venture and definitely with the t-shirt venture of like looking at size, scale, scope, et cetera. And it didn't kind of line up with where you kind of saw your life going. So talk me through, um, cause it seems like at least from my read and perspective, you had the passion for whatever it was you were doing. And clearly you're going to be successful in a number of things, but it also had to a set of parameters. And now it feels like Hawk is that, but what, maybe talk about what some of these initial companies didn't have and what Hawk kind of does have in terms of, I guess, scale or growth or different sure. things you think about. Yeah. I. I remember I left Fame Wizard after two years and brought in a CEO to take my place. And one of the big reasons at 24 years old, I was like, well, this isn't going to pay enough money to put my kids through college. I didn't have any kids. I still don't have any kids. So that was <laughs> 11 years ago. Um, but I, yeah, it just came down to, I knew that it was never going to be a big business. It was a hamster wheel. We were signing up, you know, musicians that if they weren't famous in a month, they were quitting. And so it was a really tough target market. And so learn that lesson with fame, you know, if I, 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 with all three of the businesses, or I guess I had four businesses before Hawk Media, but with the three digital businesses, each one has like a very big takeaway. And the first one was to have a good customer base. Like your target market has to have money. Like mm -hmm. that's really important if you want to make a good business. So that's what I learned in Fame Wizard with Swag of the Month, the t-shirt business. As you mentioned, we got a, about a year and change in, like almost a year and a half. And we were... We grew off press and PR. Again, I was focused on marketing. T-shirts are not hard to manufacture. That was easy to deliver. But we realized like we got, we were growing great, but 
we, and we had great unit economics, you know, we had like a, it was a $17 a month subscription and the t-shirts were sometimes free, if not three bucks, like mm -hmm. really good gross margins, really good business, but there's a scale that wasn't there yet. And so even with, you know, a few thousand customers at the time, we weren't making enough money to pay our rent, pay for t-shirts, pay my partner, pay me. And we weren't, I, I always hear this, like, I didn't pay myself for two years in a business. It's like, well, then you had to wait till you're 40, right? Because like at 24, I had to pay myself. I right. had to pay rent. I was in right. debt. <laughs> and so I was making minimum wage and so was my partner. And we were, you know, living off what we could, but we had to pay ourselves. And so we were like paying the two of us, paying for the t-shirts, paying for our infrastructure, and there was no money left. And so we were working 18 hour days, six, seven days a week trying to keep up. And it just became completely unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And so we got a point where it was like, we either need to shut this down, sell it or, uh, or raise money. And that's where I understood the idea of why people raise money, like working capital, regardless of unit economics, like there's a point where like, you got to make some money somehow. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and to be able to scale. And so we, I talked to one VC at the time, a guy named Howard Morgan, who ran first round capital. He's like a legend in the VC space. He was the only VC I had met. So I talked to him about it. And long story short, he couldn't invest because he had invested in a company that could have been a competitor, basically. And that was called fab.com and ended up being, I think, a $500 million disaster. But mm -hmm. um, we, we ended up not raising from him. And I was like, well, that's it. We talked to the VC. He didn't invest. So we, didn't, we weren't able to raise money. And I didn't know that people usually talk to like 100 or 200. I was going to say, after you put that, after one, that's that. <laughs> yeah. When I, it, yeah. I just thought that that's like, that was it. The VCs weren't in. And so I, then it was sell it or shut it down. And I literally two days later, I got a random call from a friend that owned an e-com holding company asking me if I wanted to sell the company. It was out of the blue. Uh, she had no idea what we were, uh, that we were even interested. And uh, the stipulation, I, I told her the price I wanted, which was double my debt because I was like, I'll pay off all my debt and my partner owns half the company. So perfect. And there was no hesitation. She's like, yeah, great. Come down, pick up a check. I'll do it. But you have two, two things. You can't say who bought it and you can't say how much they paid. And I was mm. like, okay. I obviously shot too well on the price though, because they paid in yeah. full right there. No questions asked, but <laughs> in looking back, I definitely did. But I was then, it was an interest, but I knew I had to get out because there was no way I could scale that organically. And so I did it. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I sold it, which was an interesting point. Like I'd say prior to COVID, one of the most stressful parts of my life, I was broke and I had no job and no business. My, re my lease was up on my apartment. There's a whole longer story there. But literally I was like, I paid off my debt, which meant I wasn't negative, but I was right. flat broke with no income, which was great. Cause like I got into a decent amount of debt my first four years out because of, you know, I made minimum wage at fame wizard. I made minimum wage at swag. I made nothing. I made $350 my first year out of college living in LA. So it was not a good situation, but paid that all off was sitting there going. And I was really stressed. Cause then it's like, well, I don't want to just go back into debt. And frankly, I like, I had zero cash. So I was going to do credit card, uh, I forgot what they call them, cash advance. Like it was like mm -hmm. not a good situation trying to figure out what lease I can sign because I had no apartment either. And I quickly started applying for jobs and got offered, got offered the head of biz dev at Live Nation and the head of e-com at Warner Music within three weeks, plus to come consult for a uh, little startup incubator that had just launched a cool brand called Dollar Shave Club. And all of them offered me 100K a year, which again, I had made minimum wage up to that point. So right. I was like, You're I'm like, rich. Whoa. And I had no yeah. idea that my value. So I was like, I'm rich. We're good. But yeah. it, those three weeks between that were as much as in hindsight, it's three weeks, whatever. During those three weeks, I had no idea what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. And against uh, a lot of advice I got from a lot of people around me, I did not take the two, you know, flagship companies, Warner Music and Live Nation. I was like, nah, I don't really want to do that. I want to go to this incubator. And I heard a ton of negative of why that was a bad thing sincerely, I was 25 at that point. The reason I chose the incubator more than anything, I really wanted to be in startups, but I really didn't want to commute to Burbank or Hollywood. And they were in Santa Monica. I was like, yeah. I'd rather just stay in Santa Monica. Yeah. And they were all offering the same fee. And I was like, who knows how any of these work out. But I did know that the bureaucracy of a big company might drive me nuts too. And so joined the incubator and then helped them launch an activewear brand, built that for a year they tried to vertically integrate too fast and blew all of our funding in a month and uh, ended up helping them sell it to Valley Total Fitness, which kicked off consulting, which kicked off Hawk Media. 
Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many, there's so much to mine from that story and I appreciate you sharing it and you share it really well in the book as well. Um, just as a reminder, anyone listening in, you can put questions in the Q and a box and we'll get to that a little bit later. So, uh, as, as we're talking, put, pop them in there. Cause we want to hear from you guys as well through the course of this conversation, but you know, you and I talked a little bit before this about, you said, you know, who the book is for. Obviously, I love what you said about, you know, these people running these big companies that might not be marketers, but also there is to me an essence of entrepreneurship or young yeah. entrepreneurship. I think this is your story is an incredibly inspiring story, sort of irregardless of what type of business, in your case, it's marketing, but for, but, but per, for persistence, for, you know, kind of going after it and kind of trusting your gut and your instincts. It's so easy. And certainly I've been there as well. And I, have made similar decisions with you, which is to say no to a bunch of money to keep kind of following my bliss. And in the end, it, it's worked out really well for me. But I had those sort of inflection point moments where people are like, well, don't you think you should take the more secure job with your education and with your this and whatever? Um, and look, I think that that's a good path for some people. But I do applaud you for in that moment of doubt, um, kind of going, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. And it's funny that it's, you know, dictated by the factor of proximity. But hey, you know, yeah. whatever, that, that was a thing. Well, pointing you in the right direction. And that's why I always like to talk about it is I, a lot of times I think like there's cliches, like, you know, you have to self-retention is the most important employee retention when you're a business owner, like you got to build it in a way that you want to be a part of it. And so that, I think that's critical. And so what, and I don't mean just your own business. I mean, your life, your job, et cetera. And like, I am irrationally against commuting. I know that there's rational reasons why you don't like commuting, but like, I cannot stand wasting time like that. And yeah. so every time I've had a little bit of a commute, it just drives me absolutely nuts. And I'm doing everything I can to get out of it. Well, particularly in, I mean, most places are, no one wants to commute anywhere, but in, in LA, particularly yeah. from, uh, from the beach all the way to Burbank, that's, a, that's not a fun commute at all. No, but no, that makes sense. But plus with the, I also will love what you say, you know, you said it right at the beginning, you said, well, in each one of those ventures, I learned something, you know, I learned something. And you, you know, it's easy to look back on your young twenties, but it's for really any person starting a business at any phase, um, a book that a line that I have in, in my in my newest book that I've loved for a long time, which is it's a, a simple math equation, you know, failure plus perseverance equals success and really being able to reorient failure, quote unquote failure, like, oh, this business about, you know, fame wizard didn't exactly work out. I didn't make enough money or I sold my company for too little at this point. But those all things were building blocks. Those are all stepping stones yep. to Hawk and what you've been able to create ultimately. And, and I imagine there, there'll be can, other iterations as you continue to grow and build this business, right? Well, that's the thing about failure. It's only failure if the clock stops there. Like, it's like, yeah, I mean, you can fail in the moment, sure. But like, nobody talks about that one failure unless they never do anything past that. And I think that that's super important. It's like, yeah, I mean, if you want to take each one of those businesses in a nutshell, like I didn't retire a billionaire. So I guess they're all failures if that was the goal. But like, <laughs> I learned a ton, as you said, there were stepping stones to get to, you know, frankly, what I find is my calling. Like, I love running Hawk Media and being a part of it. And like, could have sold it a long time ago many times and have no desire to. So it's being able to land there, I would not consider any of them a failure because it's the only reason I'm here. I love that. I love that. Let's go back a little bit to the, the book writing process. We touched on it before, but uh, as a fellow author, I'd love to just know, talk to me about some of your pain points. Like writing a book, I think that people, it's one, it's one of those things where I feel like is a a classic or almost a cliched bucket list. Like one day I should write a book, one day I should. And I, I actually am a voracious reader. I love books, have always loved books. Um, but now having written a book, I don't know if you feel this way, but I remember it was January 14th, 2020 when I published my first book. Yep. And I did this book signing in the Union Square uh, Barnes and Noble in Manhattan. I had been live on the Today Show that morning and then I went to do this book signing. It's an iconic, you know, bookstore right there in Union Square. I'm sure you've been yep. there. Definitely and have. I walk in and I look around. I love bookstores, always have, but I look around at all the books and that bookstore has like all these different, you know, six floors and escalators and whatever. And I look around, I go, I know how much energy it took to write my one book, the cup, the years and whatever. Yep. And I look around at all of these books and realize that these people's souls literally yep. and their hard work and their blood and their sweat and their tears are in all of these pages. It gave me this just newfound respect for what it takes to write a book. So in that vein, talk to me about just the, the you know, you said the process, the guy you worked with all yep. this and the content was there, but I think you potentially, maybe, maybe not, maybe the one person ever that it was easy for, but I imagine that there's some pain points, some struggles, some challenges. Just talk about yeah. the process, like what that yeah. really looks like behind the scenes a little bit. 
Yeah. So the, uh, the initial content, like the, the first draft was not that hard because again, it came from a place like, and it, that's the thing, if you want to put it into context, like after the decade of doing this, it wasn't that hard. So to be, to be clear, when I say hard, I don't mean bad, you know, it's just no, it's, totally, it's, it's totally challenging, right? No, like but I mean, it's like, rewarding, et cetera. I sat on zoom like this with Jesse. So to his credit, he made it easy. And I'm just like, all right, chapter one, what is, you know, <laughs> chapter one's my story. Okay. Let's just go for it. And I just talk for 30 minutes and then be like, all right, like now let's go edit it. And then we would go, the editing part was a lot harder. And we had a, quite a few people involved in that to make sure because when you're looking at it over and over again, it's like, I don't know, I think this is good. And then someone else comes in. My favorite thing is so far, you know, we've distributed a few books the past week to like influencers and stuff. And I got one piece of uh, uh, sort of constructive criticism. And it was something about one in one chapter, I talk about the uh, French decor and then go into a UK ref, a, a British reference. Mm. It's like, you know, you kind of mixed French and British there. And I'm like, I should. Great. If that's the <laughs> negative feedback that's going to come from this, thank God, because I am curious because I'd say I'm, the, I'm a very secure person, but I definitely feel a little insecurity because like this is memorialized now. Like it's totally, uh, you know, well, my, and it's so strategy. funny. I, uh, in reading back all my drafts, literally this week, I'm submitting the copy edited manuscript of my second book to my editor. Yep. So I've been in the granular weeds and it's so much, I've, I've read it, I've written it, I've written it. Good. I spent all this time on it, whatever. And then like, I go through it for the millionth time and I find like, wait, you introduced this person in this paragraph and yep. then you're reintroducing them here. Like there's a continuity issue yep. or a little thing. It's funny. I, uh, another little anecdote about that. Um, I, did you do an audio book? Did you record an audio book? Yeah. Are you going to it's yeah. coming out in a month, but yes. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So I, and you read it, you read it yourself? No, 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 no. You I, I yourself. Okay. So a, yeah. a good friend that has just got the most ridiculous voice and had to use it. <laughs> that you, you got to go with that. So I read my own audio book, which nice. is a very weird meta experience. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but it's a, it's a funny process because you're sitting in a production booth and th this guy, it's his full, you know, this is what he does his whole career. And if you miss one word, he stops you. If you're like, if I say, and I did this, he goes, no, it's, and I did this. It's like a tedious process because yeah. you have to hit every word, but I loved it. it. It was a fun process. But the thing that was so interesting is I was reading on what was the third pass, the very, very, very final pass before the books go to print. And I found six typos in reading through it for the album. He goes, people always find typos, always. Yep. And it's just yep. the thing about books, like, the amount of editors, the amount of people, the some people yep. supporting you, yourself, all the things. And there's still, um, and that's just, and that, that's at the highest level of publishing at the high, you know, it's, it's yep. wild how it is. And just books are one of those things that just, it's like almost impossible to get them perfect. You're giving me like an idea of like, maybe I should do like an Easter egg hunt to find the typos and mistakes in the book. Cause we can always, <laughs> obviously the second print, we can fix all of them. So we might as totally. well just go like, let's go make the edits. What, what are all the things that you guys find? <laughs> maybe do a little <laughs> prize around it. Um, oh. But yeah, we, it, no, I mean that, and that's the part it's when typos less, because I think like, if anyone's going to really be angry that I have a typo, it's more like my principles, my thoughts on these different sure. channels, et cetera. And like, so we, you know, I drilled my, I looked at it over and over again. Like, do I feel confident in putting this out there? Cause once it's out, it's out. Like yeah. there's, I think 12 to 15,000 books going out this week. Like it's, it's going and it's, you know, it's going to be in the hands of everyone. So I think being critical of myself in that sense, cause I'm usually one to like, I'm more about shipping it than have being perfect. Meaning mm -hmm. like, I think there's way yeah. more to benefit from an execution than there is in perfection. In yeah. this case, want it to be as close to perfect as possible. Totally. Um, it's different than, you know, you, you mentioned speaking. I do a lot of speaking myself yeah. and it's different than that. You, a few ums and a few ahs or you don't nail this perfect. It's like, okay, well, there was 500 people in the room and, you know, it wasn't my best day. Fine. But yeah. it's different when you're like, this is my book. And like, I always have that thought experiment of, um, you know, my grandchild or my child 30 years from now picking this yep. up and they're like, what did you write? Why did you yeah. say this? You know, whatever. It's just like, you know, it's, it's there for, for all of time, but that's also why it's such a cool medium, right? Because it yeah. is in this world where we, you know, are used to these 15 second videos and this quick content and stories that disappear and all this, like a book, it's still, you know, it's crazy, but we still believe in these things, these pieces of paper that we can hold in our hand and flip yep. through, um, which is still a special thing. Was there anything, you know, in and around this book or the business, obviously, if you didn't share it, I wouldn't expect you to share it here, but where you were kind of like a little bit, I don't know, insecure might not be the right word, but just kind of like, should this be in there? Shouldn't it be in there? Kind of you toiled over it and ended up putting it in there or anything like yeah. that. Were you pretty clear? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I was pretty queer, but I added in partnerships was like a new thing that I hadn't done a lot of talking on, but like, it's a huge part of our business and it's become something. And so the idea of like marketing partnerships, being a partner, building your ecosystem, like it has been something I've always intuitively done and a lot of businesses thrive off of, but I don't think it's talked a lot about in marketing. And so that was something we definitely added in. Um, I don't remember if there's what well, else another question about that, actually, because yeah. I, I like that part. That was a part of the book that I really enjoyed. Um, you particularly you tell a story about COVID specifically. You know, you've got this business, you're, you're marketing to folks or people are spending money with you because they're marketing to all these clients. And all of a sudden the economy shuts down, borders start closing, people's business models completely shift. And you yep. start asking yourself, as many people did in that moment in various business, like, do I even have a business anymore? Is this entire yep. thing going to go up in flames? And you kind of talk about in the book how your, you know, quote unquote partnerships kind of saved the day. I, you yep. know, I know you don't want to give away all the content of the book, but I think that was a really powerful and salient point. Talk me through when you say partnerships, because I think that yeah. can be defined in a lot of different ways, but you're using it in a specific way here. I'd be, be curious to hear a little bit more about it's, that. I thought that was very powerful. Yeah, it's really building an ecosystem in a community of companies targeting the same customers that but that are non-competitive um, so that you can always look out for each other. And so when I talk about like how that saved us in COVID, we actually were able to tell each other which clients of ours weren't pulling the plug and saying, screw it, we're out of business versus ones that were going attacking and being like, hey, these companies are doing well. And we shared a lot of business back and forth. We threw events together online. We, you know, that if, if I've got, in this case, let's say I've got 600 customers and Postscript, the SMS platform, I think they have like 12,000 customers, but it's a little bigger. But the point is, there's a Venn diagram there where some overlap, but there's a lot that don't. And in, instead of me going out and trying to cold call those customers or market to them or advertise to them, Postscript can just make the introduction and vice versa. It's free. And if we can help each other that way, we can get the mutual benefit out of it too. It doesn't cost either of us anything. It's just a great way to grow. Now, developing those partnerships takes time, but it's a very solid foundation for a business because you also don't need to just keep throwing money at it for it to work. You need to throw time and energy and community into it and pay attention to it. But it's just, yeah, it's always been a very powerful side to our business is those channel partnerships and building, being a part of that ecosystem, as well as bringing a lot of value to that ecosystem to our head of partnership, actually Scorpio's credit. She developed a whole program where our team is incentivized to send out business so that we're the golden goose for our community and we continue to send them all business. So they all want to be partners with us. Really simple idea, but most businesses don't do that. We see it with our own partners. Well, I think that it's, I mean, in a lot of ways you say it's simple, but I think it, it cuts around against a lot of people's initial instincts, which yeah. is sort of this scarcity mentality of, yep. you know, this is, this is for me and I need to perfect, perfect, or excuse me, protect my ecosystem, protect my customer. Whereas yep. you guys are actually kind of sending away business or whatever, but you're realizing yep. the ripple effect of that exactly. coming back. And I think, you know, the, you, you talk about the three foundation, your three foundational principles of marketing. That's kind of the anchor of this book. Right. And the third one is trust. And yep. in that final chapter, the final section, so to speak, you, you know, you double down on trust and you really speak about it through the lens of, you know, how brands, how companies can build trust with their clients. And you have some really great case studies around Honest Tea or the Honest Company and a few others um, in there. But what I think what it appear, uh, realizing to me right now, I'm hearing you talk is you live those ethos in your own business. You, 100%. even though you're a marketing company, yeah. in marketing your own marketing company, you are also building trust with your B2B clients, with your larger yeah. partnerships. And clearly that has paid significant dividends in especially navigating the rough waters of COVID and all the different mm -hmm. challenges everyone's faced. So um, I thought that was a really powerful message from this uh, for any person, you know, any person building a business. And, and, and like you said, that even applies to families and relationships and interpersonal relationships 100%. and all that. It's, it's, it's all very similar. Yep. No, people want to trust. I mean, it's the stat that I've seen is 75% of people won't buy from a company they don't inherently trust. And so <laughs> if they won't buy a product from a company they don't trust, think about what they'll do with people. Like trust is a huge part of how people operate and how they open up. And so, you know, that, that has absolutely been a big driver to business, just life in general. Like uh, I actually, one of the more rewarding things that's happened to me professionally in the past year, I, I went to a program at UT Austin for a week on like, it's called Birthing of Giants, how to grow businesses basically. And uh, they asked me to contact 10 of my uh, bigger business contacts, meaning like people I do a lot of business with that I've done for a while and just ask them like, I forgot the exact question, but it was like, what's the one thing that stands out about me, positive or negative? And mm -hmm. 
Oh, no, again, a little bit of like, there's got to be a little insecurity that I'm like, I wonder what they're going to come back with. And all 10 of them, which didn't even know each other, most of them don't know each other, was some form of I'm a man of my word, or I do what I say I'm going to do, which was mm -hmm. like, so I've inherently in the people that are like the biggest business contacts I've had have built a reputation of trust and reliability. Like that is so critical to me. And like, it was, you know, super flattering, but it's something that I take seriously. And I think if you do, I, in the short term, listen, we, we've all seen the Tinder Swindler and the, what's the, the Anna movie too, where yeah, like, yeah. you can screw Creating, people. Inventing Anna. Inventing, inventing Anna, yeah. yeah. You can screw people over in the short term and maybe make some short term cash out of it. But if you're in this for the long haul, trust and being reliable and doing, you know, and con being consistent is critical to the success of a business. Talk me, I mean, this is, this is a little bit off topic, but it's a curiosity of mine is sure. you're a relatively young um, CEO founder with with the kind of scale and scope of a business that you have. Very impressive, even though it sounds like, you know, part of the, your journey of getting there was to, as we talked about, incrementally fail or at least have some sure. setbacks or learn some hard lessons. But really, you've done, accomplished quite a lot in your young career. Have you found in terms of that conversation around trust, has there ever been any difficulties? You know, you walk into a boardroom, you know, there's a couple of uh, kind of vignettes of you kind of walking into said yes. boardroom with said, you know, you know, CEO or people that are 30 years your senior, you know, walk me through that dynamic and how that yeah. has been both maybe a benefit as well as some, some moments where it maybe has been challenging for you. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, so I never looked at it as challenging. Like there, there's definitely a lot of business we've lost because we're not WPP or Omnicom or one of the big agencies. Like that's, and it's not necessarily me personally being young. It's just the business being younger and, you mm -hmm. know, people, it's It takes a long time to be able to be tried out by these bigger agencies and see how you do. And then do like years and years and years of credibility because most of the bigger companies, when their decision makers hiring you, it's because they can justify hiring you, not because they actually care about the outcome. And it's right. sad to say, but a lot of them are looking to, as they say, CYA, cover your ass. Like they want to make sure that when they, if things go good or bad, but their board or their boss says, why'd you hire Hawk Media? They go, well, of course I did. They're the top. Here are all the credentials. And other. So you mm -hmm. need that to get there. That's where it stood in a way. I actually would thank Mark Zuckerberg for uh, making it in vogue when I started this to be a young <laughs> Jewish you guy in tech. <laughs> Because yeah. like I walked in and that's why I wore t-shirts too. I wore t-shirts also because uh, I feel like there's like a uh, suits in work symbolized that real estate period in my life where I made no mm -hmm. money and I wore a suit and tie every day. I was like this, there's no correlation. So I, I t-shirts have been my thing, but I've walked into some, as you said, large boardrooms and t-shirt and jeans. And I remember, I think, I don't know if it's in the book or not. I can't remember the story is, but it's a fun story as I walked into a billionaire's office and I was wearing Converse All Stars jeans and a T-shirt, and his shoe shiner came in. And he goes, "Hey, you want your shoes shined?" And I looked down. I'm like, "They're sneakers, man." And he's like, "Just take your fucking shoes off and get them shined." I'm like, okay. Right. They like shine the toe of the sneaker. Ah. They actually did it, which was hilarious. <laughs> but it, it, you know, I never felt like, I, and I'd even get feedback like, "Maybe you should wear a collared shirt, or maybe wear a jacket." I'm like, this is who they want me to be too. They want this young tech guy mm -hmm. to help them with their marketing and figure out this digital stuff, air quotes, that like that that's what they're looking for. So the part that I was authentically was the part they wanted someone to play. And so I didn't need to, if I walked into a suit, they'd assume I was selling them something. If I walked right. into a t-shirt, it's like, I know what I'm doing. If you need me, you need me. And that's always been my tactic anyways. That's a, I, I love that. I think there's a ton of wisdom in that. It reminds me of a, a moment, a very kind of seminal moment in my speaking career. One of my first big paid speeches many years ago, it was at the Ritz Carlton in Philly. And I was, I don't know, in my late twenties probably. And I was the closing keynote of this big conference. And it was like this big cosmetics convention or something like that. A thousand people in the room, fancy ballroom, you know, the whole deal. Um, and this other other guy was the opening keynote and since I was like you know cutting my teeth as a professional speaker at the time I was like I want to watch this other guy you know I want to yep. see how other people do this people that are more established than me and I'm a you know I'm a professional athlete I'm a much more of like a t-shirt and jeans and sneakers yep. like kind of guy in fact my my book actually opens up with a little bit of an anecdote that I can totally relate to there but this story so funny I, I see the guy I get up to see his speech he's speaking at 8 a.m and I'm speaking at the end of the day 3 p.m but I'm like I gotta get up early and see him his name's Mick Ebling and he's from uh he's from Venice uh, California nearby you yep. and he gets up on the stage and he's wearing he's like a middle-aged dude middle-aged like guy but he's got like skinny jeans on this flat brim hat and this tight t-shirt 
And I'm like, whoa. And he gives this speech and it's a great speech. He's got this cool tech company. He's doing all this amazing stuff, whatever. Gets a standing ovation. And I'm like, whoa, wow. But I had only packed like a tie and a suit and a coat, which is like, so not me. Cause you've seen me speak. But like, yeah. I was like, I was like, I think I'm going to the Ritz Carlton in Philly and it's a bunch of fancy <laughs> business people. I better go up there. And so I give my speech and it goes just fine. Whatever. It's certainly not my best many years ago. And I, I get his card and I, I call him up. And I say, Hey, can I just reach out to you? Um, because you've been doing this longer. I want to get some of your advice. And I call him up and he goes, I was like, I just was really surprised that you just walked on stage running. He goes, dude, I'm a tech guy from Venice, California, man. Yep. Like these guys from the East coast and their suits are hiring me to talk about this and that. Like I need to be myself. Like this yep. is me. This is why, like, this is why it's authentic. And so anyways, it was a great lesson for me in my young speaking career. I don't think I've ever worn a suit. Did you ever test since. like bringing in climbing gear when you <laughs> yeah exactly i give them my full climbing suit <laughs> but but no it's a good point i mean like you said it's people are looking for this as well as you're you're coming of age in this moment where social media is changing people are digitally native and now yep. we're seeing you know gen z really come up through the ranks you know in the early 20s and stuff like that in the workforce now but it's interesting and i think that you know well, you've obviously done a great job navigating that and using it to your advantage well and one one really big point too is if they were looking for a buttoned up 50 year old that had, you know, decades of experience in marketing, like they're not going to like working with me because <laughs> right. that's not who I am. So I think that was part of it too, is like the few people that I, I remember, I, someone asked me if, you know, they're looking for someone for a decade of experience in Facebook ads and Facebook ads hadn't been out for a decade. And it was <laughs> like, that's, that's really funny. That like, is like funny. You, you could, I've literally been in e-commerce since Facebook launched their ad platform. Like you cannot have more experience than myself on a timeline basis right. and, or, or, you know, or a team as an example. And so it was like, and same thing with TikTok. Like I've seen job ads for like looking for someone with four years, TikTok advertising experience. Like it launched last year, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> so we, we still deal with it sometimes with our team where people go on LinkedIn and look at some of our employees and they'll be like, they only have five years marketing experience. How are they going to grow my brand? It's like, they have literally more experience than about anyone can in these platforms. And they're surrounded by data. Like it's an argument that we get that it's like, you are looking at the wrong things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I just want to throw it out there again. We'd love to get some questions yeah. from the audience, put some Q and a uh, in the Q and a box, a chat box, whatever. I um, would love to hear what questions you have for Eric or of course myself, but this is uh, this is Eric's day. This is his pub day for the Hawk method. It's very exciting. So put some questions in there if you want. I had a question for you, which maybe is a little bit of a meta question, but there is, you're a marketing guy. You've written a book. One of the key things to a successful book, at least in terms of the external success of lots of people buying said book, lots of people reading said book, is actually marketing a book. Yep. Um, yep. And it's an interesting thing. Um, my publisher is Simon and Schuster, you know, at the mm -hmm. highest levels of publishing, whatnot. Yep. It's interesting. They, you know, they have marketing arms within these publishing companies, but it's also kind of a, an open secret that they're very good at publishing, printing books, supply, you know, shipment, all this kind of stuff, but they're not marketers. Yep. And it has kind of fallen on a lot of authors to lean into their own website or their own following. And, and, and then not to say that the publishing companies don't help because they absolutely do, but their, their core competency is not marketing. Yep. Um, and so I'm curious to hear kind of your process, not in writing the book, but actually once this book came to life, you circle the date on your calendar, March 8th. Yep. And people that don't know this books always come out on Tuesday. So that's why yep. it's a Tuesday right now. Um, I learned that my first go round. So it comes out and what's been the process of thinking you're you have a marketing company now and a product to sell what's the yep. process of that been like so that's where the hard part came in just being blunt like the, the creating the book was it, it was work but i wouldn't call it it wasn't difficult it was a lot of people worked hard don't get me wrong but like it, it was doable it's kind of how i felt about operations back in the day where it's like i can make a t-shirt takes work knows how to but like that's not the, the part is like so how, now what are we going to do? What's the goal for the book? Like, how are we going to sell a bunch? Like, what are we going to go for? And we made the decision go for New York Times, which we'll see because now it turns out, I just found out a friend of mine that is way more successful and prominent than I am sold probably four times the amount of books I'm probably going to sell and did not get it because there's an editorial factor to New York Times that they don't like business books that much. But um, we'll see. I didn't know that jumping into it. So we went for it. And so with that, uh, came like, okay, so we need to fire on all cylinders. And what I'm not used to in marketing is not being able to be iterative. Like most businesses I built, including mm -hmm. my own, if something doesn't work, okay, don't do that again. Let's try something else. Like it's, you can really test and try, but the book, 
we'll find out in the next two weeks whether this is a big seller or not. Like it's that's it. Like there's no well, let's iterate and test something else the next, you know, week three, unless we want to keep hammering at it. But it doesn't the the first two weeks really matter, as you know. So we uh, you know, I basically brought on a great uh, book marketing company, my partner Jesse with his launch team company has been great. We brought on an incredible PR firm in Krupp PR. We brought on uh, Charlie Fusco to advise us on how to make these lists. We brought on all the different people that we work with already on Hawk Media's marketing. So Cred PR for speaking and Geffen Media for podcasts and uh, Relevance for a lot of the PR as well. Our own team has put a ton of effort into this. I mean, this was designed by Hawk Media's designer, Mm -hmm. Kaylin. So this is the book was literally designed by our team. John Carlo, who uh, was our e- my EA, then our uh, interim head of marketing and really took this on as his project to spearhead, crushed it and like coordinated all this with Marisol, who's you know our PR person internally, coordinating a lot of the PR stuff as well. And like the amount of PR we've been able to get for this is more than I've ever been able to get for Hawk Media side of things. So, you know, being on some TV shows that are coming out soon, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about them yet, but then... Uh, I was on Adam Carolla's podcast last week. Like the, I think I've been on four or five podcasts a day. Like the amount that we had to put into this, plus you know hitting up every partner that we've mentioned in the book and every partner we have and every customer and every employee and just getting as many books out there as possible and firing on all cylinders. We sent, including yourself, all the guests on my podcast, a few other influencers are in our ecosystem, any podcast I've been on that we could get a hold of, we sent a gift box to get them to talk about the book too. And so it's, you know, the amount of different moving parts to get this. And then this is a good example. Like as we speak, day one launch, Amazon sells out of the book and the first thing in the morning. And we, <laughs> they're just, we have 5,000 books sitting, waiting for them to pick it up that they're not picking up. But this is, this is, it's funny because it feels like running a startup where it's like, this is the shit that happens. Like as much as I could be freaking out right now, thankfully we're all doing different things to try to figure this out. But we have like 10 different random bookstores selling it at a discount to the Amazon price. Amazon is sold out, even though it's supposed to be print on demand. So you can buy it for a discount. The problem is, is that doesn't count towards book sales for the New York Times bestseller. So it's like these funny things that you're like, great. So now a bunch of people are probably buying the book at 11 bucks, which they'll still get the book. That's still great, but it's going to screw over that one initiative that frankly, the investment was all around. So we invested a ton of time and money into trying to get this thing. And Amazon could be screwing us over right now, or we'll fix it by tomorrow. (laughs) It's very interesting. You know, there's a, as I, as I've learned navigating the whole book process myself, I was very grateful that my first book became a New York times bestseller. That was my goal as well. But there was so much, like you said, clouded that you serve out of your control. And so the day I, uh, I launched my book on the today show, um, which I was so grateful. They did this great special, but I was supposed to do all of these shows in at the NBC headquarters in Rockefeller center. This is back in the day when you would actually go to these places in person. Um, and, uh, this is, uh, you know, MSNBC is lined up. We've got CNN after that across the street, Fox and friends, we've got all this stuff lined up. And as I'm live on the today show, this woman uh, who's, who, who works there goes and whispers to my wife, who's in the green room and says, um, Nancy Pelosi is giving Trump the articles of impeachment today. Um, you're not doing any press for the rest of the week or Russia. Yeah, I was supposed to be exactly. on Fox Business last <laughs> exactly. week. It's like, there's some other things going on. <laughs> exactly. And look, those are way more important than my book launch, but it's the same thing. It's no, you put this day, yeah. you plan all this time. And like I said, yeah. super grateful to have still hit that list. Fine. But all of a sudden, all this PR is wiped out. And then a week later, Kobe Bryant dies. A few weeks later, uh, COVID happens. And it's just like, you know, the, the world goes on. Yeah. And, you know, the world doesn't care about your book. And I would exactly. say, like, your, <laughs> your book, I'm just going to say it is way more interesting than my book. Like you walked across Antarctica, like for anyone that doesn't know Colin, like he's the first person to walk by himself across Antarctica, 54 days, right? Yeah. yeah 54 yeah. days pulling a 350 pound sled. 375. If we're there going you go. to get, yeah, get that 25 pounds. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you're and so that's why like that, that's the other thing with launching this is like, as much as I want this to resonate with everyone, not everyone cares about marketing. Like the, your story is inspiring for just about everybody. And so it's figuring out how to navigate that and get people interested in this and, yeah. Well, it seems like it's doing well. I know. I mean, Amazon yeah. being sold out means people are buying it. And when I, yeah. right before we logged on, I saw it's already number one in SEO, number one in a bunch of categories yeah, on Amazon. Number so one in media, definitely- SEO, and five in multi-level marketing, which I, we, I find funny. I think yeah. someone, someone, when we first put on there, tagged it at multi-level tagged marketing. It, yeah. And yeah. it was like, 
We're number one in multi-level marketing. It has <laughs> nothing to do with multi-level marketing, but thank God. Okay. <laughs> well, we've got a couple, uh, to, we've got 12 minutes left in the hour yep. to round out this conversation. We've got a oh, few go. uh, in the Q&A, so let, let's get to that. Um, Sonny uh, has a question here, which is, what is your vision for Hawk Media for the future? Um, I sure. think you've built this amazing point. And it's incredible, but as you said, you're young and you just said, at least on this comment, you're not planning to sell it at least right now. So what, yeah. what's the plan for the future? Yeah, I don't know if I ever will because the the joy and the everything that I get derived out of it, I don't think someone could pay me enough, frankly. And thankfully I make enough money to pay my bills. And after that, what, what else do I need money for? It's a weird thing to say, but it's kind of, you know, from where I'm coming from, but the future, like we're, we now joke, but it's ser uh, joke and serious marketing world domination. Like we are expanding internationally. We are growing really fast. We grew 70% last year. I think we probably will do the same this year. We've got, you know, it's, it's a constant, uh, massaging to build a business. There's constantly things we have to fix and work on and repair and do better with, but I, it's all, it's, we're moving down the field over and over again. And so we, we are do have some really exciting things I can't quite announce yet, but we are again, expanding internationally. We have some other acquisitions we're going to be announcing soon that really change the way we do business in a positive way, continue to march down this path of accessibility to great marketing for everyone. And so it actually announced yesterday, but we closed our second venture fund yesterday. Um, so we, we didn't mean for the press to go out till Thursday because we wanted to yeah. book like, but yeah. we'll, we'll be talking about it probably later this week. But we, we went from a $5 million fund to closing the first part of a $50 million fund. We closed wow. 25 of it. So congratulations, venture, man. thank you. So the venture side has been exciting. Our hot capital side and financing is great. And like, it's all just, you know, it, it's starting to click in a lot of ways that like, we have a pretty strong vision of what this could look like globally and it's starting to go. And so yeah, just continuing. And then at the same time, just fixing the day to day, like, hey, you know, maybe we should make our reports a little better. Maybe we should do a couple more things for our employees to make them happier. Like all the little stuff is a big part of the job too. But the, again, the, the goal being we want this to be thousands of people all over the world. That's beautiful, man. I love the vision. And I, I love what you said, you know, you, when you find something and, and we all have different interests, different likes, but when you find something that you're pa passionate about, I had an older mentor of mine, a guy in the financial industry who had a huge influence on my early career and very, very wealthy guy. And I looked at him, I'm like, I don't get it, man. Like you drive from the suburbs of Chicago to downtown Chicago every single day to go to work. It's his business. He's got 500 people trading for him, whatever. I'm like, but I don't get it, man. Like, why do you go to work every single day? Like you obviously don't have to, this guy's very yeah. wealthy. Right. And he was like, because this is what I love doing. I'm passionate yeah. about it. And for him at that phase, he was mentoring the younger people coming up to the ranks. And that was just so deeply fulfilling for him. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, he's in the financial industry. So it is a game of making money as yours as a business, sure. yours is a business about making money. But there he found this sort of more depth of his own personality and fulfillment in there. And that was, that was an interesting for me as a, you know, young 20 some year old buck was like, I'm doing X to make Y for yeah. to be like, Oh, huh. There's a deeper layer of that. So that's really cool that you're in touch with that, man. I have to get to a point where your bills are covered like that's of that course of course but, but once that's covered I, I would say that you can derive that passion out of anything like it, for that guy it's it's mentoring but it also for a while could have been the hunt just the the idea totally, of doing yeah. deals has nothing to do with the it's not like it's making money for a scoreboard it's not necessarily making money so you can buy a ferrari it's making money just for the sake of like it's fun to make money yeah, for the love of the forever. game man for yeah, the love exactly of the game. We've got another question coming in. We've got a few more uh, people put your questions in the Q&A. We're going to do Q&A for the, this last 10 minutes here. we got some good ones coming in. Uh, Kate, um, Kate has a question. Um, curious how you think about trends in our culture today. How do you think about trends, how quickly trends move, and how you best leverage them for your business? This is like the yeah. all-time great marketing question. Yeah, um, I love it because... I definitely think of this differently than most. I think uh, do not chase the shiny object. Everybody, it's so funny. Like NFTs are that right now. Like everybody jumps in. I'm not saying that there's not money to be made, but the expected value of making money is very low. Meaning like for the 0.0001% of people that are making money in F NFTs, everyone else is wasting their time and their money. Like, and that's, I, I really believe that. And so it, it happened with AR, VR, like four or five years ago and AI, even though it wasn't actually true AI. Like there's always a buzzword, especially in marketing. There's always a new platform and you have to really look, like, you don't need to be a first mover. I think first mover advantage is a fallacy unless you are truly the first mover. Like, uh, who was it? Um, Progressive Auto Insurance, I think was one of the first advertisers on Snapchat and they got a bunch mm -hmm. of PR around it. Congratulations. They also spent hundreds of thousands of dollars that probably didn't do anything for their business because 
the press did, but the actual advertising, like everyone's like, why mm-hmm. is someone advertising to me on Snapchat? So you don't need to be a first mover. Paying attention to all these things is critical to stay on top of it, but jumping in and doing it, it's just a distraction. And like up until a year ago with the iOS changes, Facebook was the golden goose for like over a decade. Like you could just advertise on Facebook for any lifestyle brand and you're going to do fine if you're doing it right. And now that's shifted a little bit. There's, it's a little harder, but it, it was a decade of that. So like, you don't need, you didn't need to be on top of everything all the time and frantic. I think people drive themselves nuts that way. And it's actually, you can run tried and true formulas and they are going to work for a long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. I love that answer. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've all gotten caught up in the hype of this, that, or the other thing. Um, yep. But kind of, it seems like you've built this business the, your business as a whole and as your advice to your clients is, is part and parcel for this, which is how are we building this for the long run? Let's let's use what we can now, but also probably acknowledging technologies are going to change, trends are going to yeah. change, things are going to shift. And if you're always constantly having to reorient and, oh, no, no, this is the shiny new object. This is this. Let's yeah. try this. Let's try this. I'd say the good, com- yeah, yeah. And the, the good comparison there is like AR, VR, which up until COVID, no one had any headsets, but people were spending all this money on creating VR experiences. And it's like, why nobody cares. And it's a ton of money versus SMS marketing, which we did go heavy in early on because everyone's already using SMS. Everyone's already text messaging. So now we can tap into it as marketers. They finally made it legal in the U S like it was gray. And then it became very black and white. Like, here's how you can do SMS marketing. And these platforms got proliferated. We invested in one of them postscript and went all in on that. And it's been a very lucrative channel because the delivery is already there. And then you have things like, like TikTok is a great example. Their advertising platform is really starting to catch on. It's working. It's going to get a lot better, I believe. So it's not like I'd go all in on TikTok yet, but I'd definitely start using it. Whereas mm-hmm. two years ago, there wasn't much to do on brands unless you really tried to mess with it, but it wasn't authentic. We got a couple of last questions here before we wrap this up. Um, I love this question coming in from Eddie. Uh, we kind of answered the second part of this, which was if you would change anything about the book after the fact, but his whole question is in regards to your book, which part of it are you most proud of? And if you could a- change any part of it after the fact, what would it be? Uh, the part that I'm most proud of, uh, shoo, I'm trying to think of how to put this because it's a, it's a combination of, and there's a reason I put by Eric Human and the Hawk Media team. It's like, this wasn't all me at all. And we, there's a whole, you know, people ask how I'm able to do all these things and stay on top of it. It's a like, great team. Like it, there's not even a second answer. It's like, there's amazing people around me. And so the part that I'm most proud of is that this is something that is, you know, this actually means it's the meaning behind this. The fact that like we've grown over now 3,700 brands successfully. Um, and I haven't. No, it's not Eric, it's we, it's Hawk. It's all the people that put all the work into it. And so the fact that we can stand on this incredible data point of like, these are all the companies we've been able to successfully work with. And that's something we've all been doing together. That's definitely uh, the proudest part. The part I'd change is very easy. I edited the hell out of this, except for the opening page where it's all the praise. These were actually praises that were given to me for my first book, uh, just being transparent. And so these are six years old. All these people I'm still in touch with, but half their titles have changed. Uh, so, so I'm like, ah, Robin Ward is not the head of new media ventures at United Talent Agency anymore. And hopefully Sam Wick, who's a great guy, is not angry that I took his title. Um, so mm-hmm. it's that we're going to change that because I looked sure. at it like, oof, that got through the uh, felt details, details. I texted yeah. all of them. I was like, just a heads up. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> the... Um, to your first point about what you're proud of, and I think it shines through in your dedication, you know, right at the front of this book, you say to the hardworking employees of Hawk Media who make amazing marketing accessible to everyone. It's clear in this book, this is not, you know, it's your name on the cover, or whatever, but this is clearly not the Eric show. I did all these amazing things. Look how smart I am. It really is very clear to me that it's a collaboration of ideas and people you've surrounded yourself with and thought partners and partnerships in other businesses and a across the board. And I, you know, I really think that that shines through. So I applaud you for that. And I think that that's a sign of a great leader, honestly, as someone who's, you know, you know, can be in the stand in the spotlight, but also can share that spotlight with all the various people and components that have gone into making this, you know, a thing. Yeah. The, the motivation for being that person is because I can be, and it drives for Hawk. Like the end of the day, like this is all about building Hawk media. So if I could have put, you know, the Hawk method written by Hawk media, and that would have actually gotten on shelves. That would have been what it said. It's not about my name. I just know there's certain things you can have a brand do and certain things an individual has to do to build that. As yeah. you know, Hawk Media yeah. can't speak on a stage. I can. So yeah. I end up doing that, but it's all about driving to that purpose. 
Well, we're going to close out with one question, which uh, is from an anonymous attendee. So we have no idea who put this question, but I think this question is hilarious um, only because in my own life, uh, things are always like this. So I go climb Everest and I come back down and someone says, so what are you going to do next? You walk across yeah. America. What's the next <laughs> continent are you going to walk across? So today your book came out March 8th, 2022, The Hawk Method. People should pick this up. Um, and uh, it's flying off the shelf so much that it's sold out on Amazon right now, but you can get a copy. But the final question is, now that you've written one book, are you interested in writing a follow-up to the Hawk Method? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, not today. Um, I think what I'm trying to figure out is like, I want to go through this again in the next six months and see what needs to be updated and do an updated version. I think I'll probably double down on this. Uh, I think at some point I'll revisit Greedless, but uh, I don't know. Like, I, I, we'll see how the end of the process goes. I might end up super frustrated. Maybe Amazon doesn't fix this shit. And I end up like not selling any books the first two weeks and going like, I hate this. I'm never doing this again. And this becomes our next, our calling card that we just give to everybody. And that could be where it goes to. I honestly don't have a plan past this part. On well, this the reason, the reason that I found that question so funny is, is my answer to that. I'd be like, give this guy a break, man. He just worked on this for two years. It came out today, you know, let it be there. In the but world. I work the same way. Every time there's an accolade or an award or an accomplishment, I'm like, all right, so cool. Let's go. What's next? Like yeah. Yeah. it's, it's just by nature. And I have to force myself to celebrate some of these things. Like we weren't going to do anything tonight as the book launch, like we weren't going to do anything. And then we decided, oh, let's do a webinar. Like, let's do something. And then I was like, all right, there's a bookstore four blocks that way. Maybe I'll just do a book signing there and invite a few friends. And then the team blasted it out everywhere. And so it sounds like it actually might be a thing. So if you're in Brentwood, you know, LA tonight, we're doing it at Diesel Books. But uh, yeah, there's, that was a lot. We literally called them last week and we're like, yeah, we should probably do. That's a great right bookstore, now. man. That's yeah. a really great bookstore. Oh, I've heard amazing things five. about it. Um, well, Eric, my friend, huge congratulations to you. Thank I'll be you. keeping my eye on the New York Times list in the next couple of weeks as those things come out and uh, hoping, I, I think you definitely will hit the threshold of selling the enough books, but it's getting behind the the uh, the sneaky walls of editorial land exactly. to uh, see if that'll make that. But it's a, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. I learned a ton. I'm building a couple of businesses right now that lean into digital marketing marketing. So it was helpful for me to understand that. And like you said, awesome. not that I'm necessarily myself going to go execute that, but it gave me some new knowledge, knowledge about you and how you built this. And I think you should be extraordinarily proud of it. So the Hawk method, pick up your copy. It's great. And uh, congrats, ma'am. Well, I want to check out your book. There it is. There it is. There it is. That uh, August 2nd, that's coming out. Is that's it pre-ordered? You can pre-order now? You can pre-order it now on Amazon. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. So uh, the 12 hour walk, invest one day, conquer your mind, unlock your best life. It's uh, I'm very excited to share that with the world. So uh, thanks for shouting it out, man. I appreciate it. it. Yeah. going to go check it out. I'm going to buy as many copies as it'll let me right now. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, I'm grateful. And I'm uh, just like you. It's always fun to put something in the world and then being able to actually get it to the point to sharing it. So the manuscript's yeah. done, it's written. And now I'm in that marketing phase between now and August of really uh, getting this idea out into the world. Um, and it's ultimately a large call to action for people to take on a challenge in their own life and really unlock what I call a possible mindset, unlock their best life. So I'm excited to share it with the world, man. And uh, yeah. maybe we can maybe we can flip the script and do a conversation like that when that comes out uh, together. Let's do it. So, I just got, I got a bunch of copies coming now. So August 2nd, let's do it. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you. And again, huge congrats. Enjoy Thank enjoy you. all the moment and a little advice for you. I felt a little bit tight and nervous on my book day when it came out and friends of mine in New York City said, we got to have a party. We got to celebrate this. So go enjoy it. Celebrate at Diesel and appreciate Brentwood it. and with all the people that have put hard work into this. So congrats, man. And uh, enjoy the process. Thanks, man. Thank yeah. you, everyone.